thanks again for the organizers to be able to address this uh, very interesting uh, symposium. Um, here's what we're going to talk about, and it was going to be breast cancer and all cancers, but I know breast cancer, so I'm going to talk about breast cancer. And uh, we can say ditto, but less data for colon cancer, like that. So that'll be my approach. Um, this is going to be really a very much conventionally based approach in terms of, um, uh, uh, as a medical oncologist, I see lots of breast cancer patients have been involved in breast cancer uh, prevention and therapy interventions for a period of time. And this goes back to one of my mentors, uh, which was Ernst Winder, and he was among the people that were making this observation, and this is probably going to be one of the older slides that you'll see, 1968 food disappearance, uh, country to country, uh, by total fat intake. And that really got people interested in this area. Uh, and you can see that's quite a few kind of years ago. Um, observational studies looking at fat, that was one of the first things to be identified, uh, kind of had mixed results and, and intense national controversy um, in the epidemiological community at least. Uh, so uh, seven-day food uh, diaries showed a positive association where you're actually uh, intaking what foods the patients are, are eating, they're writing it down, and then they're questioned by a, a registered dietitian. Uh, and if you did food frequency questionnaire studies where you give someone a questionnaire and they fill it out what they've been eating the last three or six months, uh, no association was seen. Uh, and, and so uh, the controversy continued. And then we were very fortunate to really have just a wonderfully gifted person who really died um, at, at a very early age, Bernadine Healy, uh, who was the first woman director of the National Institutes of Health and whichever, government, whichever party wanted a woman director of the NIH, and she said as their cost for going into this, and this was in, this was in the early 1990s, uh, so when this was real money, she said that she needed a women's health initiative funded for at least $600 million. And they agreed to do that, and she actually didn't trust the Congress, and she didn't want it in the year-to-year -year appropriation but she wanted it, the money in the director's office in a lockbox so there would be no year-to-year -year funding, you know, and next to Al Gore's lockbox on Social Security, you might recall, some of the older people here. And so anyway, this is one of the outcomes of this, was this uh, Women's Health Initiative Dietary Modification Study. Uh, this was uh, where we randomized from 40 U.S. clinical centers, 48,835 uh, otherwise healthy postmenopausal women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, the Two to, uh, uh, kind of three to two com, uh, intervention, um, 30,000 in control, uh, close to 20,000 in the intervention, targeting dietary fat intake. Uh, at that time, it was really the opposite of a holistic approach because the science de described that you were just trying to reduce one nutrient at a time. So we're trying to reduce fat without changing anything else or changing weight. So there's no weight intake uh, uh, kind of uh, target for the, for the trial. So, uh, we were able to uh, um, get with group sessions, 16 group sessions w between 10 and 15 people. We were able to get the, uh, the um, uh, uh, dietary fat significantly lower in the intervention group. There was a modest weight loss, though, um, which was statistically significant but very small. And here's our overall result. There were, there were out of 1,727 new breast cancers, there are 9% fewer um, in a conventional, just a straight up uh, uh, statistical test that it was 0.07 with multivariate analysis. The p-value in the study goes in at 0.09, so published in JAMA as a negative study. Uh, breast cancer mortality was lower in the intervention group, again, a negative uh, p-value. Um, in the invidious uh, unplanned sub subgroup analysis, which is shown on the right-hand panel, we, we did see that women who entered with higher fat intake at entry did have a statistically fewer uh, invasive breast cancers. Actually, this was um, based on, on about seven and a half years of intervention. We're currently in the process in the study of doing an updated um, outcome uh, uh, assessment, and that sh probably should be available um, later this year. I should tell you, though, that after the intervention stops, so when you're doing um, 30,000 people as opposed to a, a smaller number, uh, women actually did revert to their old dietary kind of approaches. Then I'll go right to um, the, uh, the, the other study that, it, that was very interesting and I was happy to be involved with. Uh, this is the WIN study, Dietary Fat Intake and Breast Cancer Recurrence, Women's Intervention, 
nutrition study. This, is, this was a uh, NCI-funded study involving largely postmenopausal women with early stage, stage one to three breast cancer, uh, get, getting conventional th uh, therapy, which would have been chemotherapy for the receptor negative, hormone therapy with tamoxifen for the receptor positive. Uh, the receptor positive could also receive chemotherapy. Chemotherapy at that time was really CMF or FAC pretty much. Um, uh, later in the study, we allowed taxanes, but that was just at the end part of the study. So it's pr in the pre-taxane uh, era, um, women had to, uh, and then the intervention was diet is very similar to the WHI, but this was uh, dietary fat intake reduction or not, uh, with no weight loss intervention uh, target. And uh, actually, what happened is that this is a little bit more intensive intervention. This was 18 one-on-one -on -one visits with a, with a registered dietitian implementing a previously documented to uh, be effective in this setting of a low-fat eating plan. And um, this points out one of the difficulties, and, and all the things that I'm going to be talking about are going to be modulations of uh, modest modulations of conventional Western diets. So I'm going to make that distinction between some of the other things that you're going to hear at this convention. We're talking about things that have been done in big populations, m trying to modulate uh, a lot of the existing diets. And in the, in the left hand panel, you can see this was the percent calories from fat um, at baseline. And this was actually pretty low overall, because in our group of these breast cancer patients, they're taking from 37 U.S. clinical centers, um, they're taking about 30 percent calories from fat. You can see the, the control and intervention groups completely overlap. Um, then we show you the 12-month data where we get statistically significant four standard deviation differences in dietary intake, uh, where the dietary group had 20 percent calories from fat. Uh, that means that when you're at 20 percent of your calories from fat, I'm sure some of you in the audience know, that means that really it's not modulating the oil intake because all the fats from the foods, you really have modest, modest oil intake. So it isn't swapping out, you know, oils or salad dressings. You're not using oil-based salad dressings. Uh, so that's about as low as you can go without making major, major, major changes in diet. But but you can see in the middle that triangle, a third of the women are eating exactly the same thing, fat. You know, because you don't, it isn't like taking a pill where you have 100% versus 1%. Um, and the weight loss wasn't a target. If you're doing, following that dietary fat intake um, uh, policy and you're not having a thousand calorie hot fudge sundae that you can make and consume in 10 minutes, uh, you have difficulty coming up with that thousand calories. You know, if you're snacking on broccoli, I mean, you're gonna have, you know, you'll be on your third bowl, right? You know, and you'd still, and you'd still have more to go. But you can see a six, five to six pound weight loss was statistically significant, was achieved. This might seem to be modest, but this is the, the poster child of these, of these kind of interventions was the diabetes prevention study where, where a lifestyle intervention taking women with prediabetes um, in a large randomized trial published in the New England Journal, uh, which ended up uh, with a five pound weight loss, had 58% uh, reduction in progression to frank diabetes. So uh, you might expect something from this effect. And Actually, we did. This, is, um, this was a, 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 an ASCO plenary pr presentation uh, where we ended up having 24% uh, fewer breast cancer recurrences. Uh, editorial in the New York Times said this is the first, uh, they, they said this is the first uh, dietary uh, intervention in a full scale trial to reduce a cancer outcome. And I got to talk to Katie Couric on the Today Show. Which <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, she never acknowledged this, but I th think the timing is very suspicious. Two months after Katie Couric had that interview me with me, she was offered the anchor position at CBS. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, let's put two and two together, folks. Okay. And uh, our overall survival, funding stopped. It's really interesting. I mean, this is, we'll show you one other. Uh, there's been two uh, randomized trials in adjuvant breast cancer. Um, and of course, um, I always like to comment that there have been 37 full-scale randomized trials of taxanes in adjuvant breast cancer. I think we've learned that paclitaxel is a little better than docetaxel, and it might be better to give it weekly than every three weeks, I think. And so we need maybe another 
a few studies in that area. But you can see in the right-hand panel, um, so we didn't get funding for follow-up. This is a death registry follow-up at 108 months. Um, overall, again, a borderline result, but you can see a strong uh, suggestion of a uh, benefit in ER negative, PR negative cancers. Actually, an update of this um, a, a study group with death registry is now with additional four years of follow-up is uh, I'm currently uh, undertaking. Okay, oh, there was a negative study actually done right here in, um, based in San Diego, the WELL study, Women's Healthy Eating and Living, a little different approach where they're adding vegetables as opposed to getting down and, and, and they're not taking away a Western diet, they're adding fruits and vegetables to, uh, to a Western diet. It was supposed to target dietary calories from fat. It did a wonderful job of adding the fruits and vegetables, um, but uh, as we'll see, um, uh, didn't change the, the uh, body weight or, or fat very much, had no effect on disease-free survival, uh, led by Dr. Pierce from here. Um, but I'll show you the contrast between the Woods and Well diet for the two parameters, where I, which I think is a hypothesis that emerged from, from uh, the Wind study, is that Wins is on the right, Wells on the left. Call your attention to the baseline and six-year data for percent en energy from fat, and actually there was no loss in percent energy from fat and Well, where in Wins we did have the sustained loss. And again, although weight loss wasn't a target, uh, we did have a sustained weight loss where uh, Well actually had a little bit of a, a weight gain because of increasing the fruits, uh, in increasing the vegetable juice on top of the Western diet. So, so, I, so I think, um, um, the well study, just a different question. I think the hypothesis that, that emerged, I think that a number of people are, are trying to follow up on it, is that a lifestyle intervention targeting dietary fat resulting in weight loss uh, can influence um, uh, breast cancer, potentially influence breast cancer outcome. Now we get into the area of dietary patterns. Again, these dietary patterns are modest variations of a Western, kind of, you know, Europe, Western diet. Um, and how do you study these? Well, they've kind of come up with um, come up with acceptable patterns for either from food frequencies or food diaries where you where what's called a bit pejorative western unhealthy dietary pattern which involve high red and or processed meats refined grains potatoes sweets and high fat dairy prudent healthy dietary fat pattern high fruits vegetables poultry fish and whole grains and mediterranean is the prudent healthy uh, with olive oil or nuts and or nuts and so you get so there have been agreed upon ways to describe uh, epidemiological studies of this area. Here's the, um, uh, um, and we're very fortunate, we had a couple of just in, in the recent few years of meta-analysis of these, uh, of a number of these observational studies. And here's one looking at prudent healthy dietary pattern with the most, uh, you know, kind of consistent with that approach versus the least in, in quartiles or quintiles. And you can see that there was a, a, a lower incidence of breast cancer, uh, about 7%, uh, which was statistically significant. We look at the Western unhealthy dietary pattern and really the results are really mixed and was really pretty much uh, neutral in terms of uh, figuring out if you're, uh, if you're keeping a, a Western unhealthy diet versus not. Um, so that was kind of a, a, a mixed result for this recent meta-analysis. Um, adherence to Mediterranean diet might be a little bit more interesting. This is in this large European epic cohort with 335,000 women from, from 10 European countries. Um, and they really ended up having um, a, a, um, a, a kind of modest but statistically significant overall fewer breast cancers, um, but maybe picking up um, that, that signal that ERPR may be more likely to be amenable had 20% uh, fewer um, ERPR negatives in the most adherent to a Western diet. I call your attention to the, um, to the recent uh, New England Journal article of a randomized trial of a Mediterranean diet of over 7,000 women, um, where this is in women with existing heart disease or at risk of heart disease, where cardiovascular disease was, uh, uh, events were significantly reduced along with all-cause mortality. It was only three and a half a year follow-up. Uh, didn't have breast cancer risk factors or any uh, cancer risk factors, so didn't and didn't provide cancer outcomes. Probably too short of an interval. But uh, but and that going along with this is the this result in the Mediterranean diet from the Women's Health Study, where basically when they combined uh, women adhering to this Mediterranean diet with those who uh, were doing a little bit more uh, physical activity. Uh, then, uh, then basically they had a substantial reduction in non-breast cancer-related deaths. So Mediterranean diet, it seems like at least the modest uh, uh, 
changes associated with the Mediterranean diet may be healthful for other causes and may have somewhat uh, less potential influence on breast cancer. Um, now, uh, when we look at uh, um, uh, multivitamins had a lot of interest, and, and, and this is one of a number of negative studies that, that uh, investigators in the Women's Health Initiative uh, in our cohort of 160,000 women who really, really saw really no effect on a range of cancers. Uh, there's been some concern that, um, that, um, and that uh, about using antioxidants together with, with chemotherapy, but there's a study in, uh, uh, in China where it looked like there was associated with a lower mortality risk. Um, this uh, raises questions. I mean, the cruciferous vegetables may have a role, um, and they may be, and, and they certainly seem to be different in China in, in terms of uh, than in the United States. So that sparked some interest in, in this question. But again, antioxidants in, in, in chemotherapy uh, remains a question. Um, I, I think it's difficult to find, to, for these pill take, when you're looking not so much for diet, but when you're looking at multivitamins, when you're looking at pill taking versus non pill taking individuals, because pill taking individuals are right off the bat substantially different than non pill taking individuals, whether it's prescription drugs um, or any drugs. And these are really intriguing results. I was really happy to be involved with. We published a couple years ago. And this is, we looked at, we had 27,000 women in the hormone therapy trials. And this is unbelievable that I've gotten so far and I haven't talked about the Women's Health Initiative hormone therapy trials. This has to be a record from public speaking for me. But anyway, 27,000 women in the hormone uh, prevention trials, half of those patients got placebos. And what we're showing you here is we're comparing the women who were adherent to placebos versus the women who weren't adherent to placebos, right? Okay, so if a woman took 80% of their placebo pills compared to women who didn't, controlling for all potential confounders, of which we had many, many uh, potential confounders, breast cancer risk factors, falls for hip fracture, you know, um, kind of a, a surrogate for bone mineral density, and you can see that adherent placebo takers associated with 36% less risk of dying 50% less hip fractures, so kind of 27% less invasive breast cancers, all with p-values. And actually, we haven't been able to explain this very well. And now we're looking into another range of, with conventional confounding factors, we're looking into, uh, to, um, into more psychological factors to potentially explain this. But this really uh, suggests caution when you're comparing pill takers to non-pill takers. And, and that's, it's really interesting study. Now we get another controversial area, um, which is vitamin D and breast cancer incidence. Um, uh, we heard about the fact that it's really a, a kind of hormone, okay, <laughs> instead of a vitamin. But so selective observational studies have associated higher vitamin D intakes and 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels with higher breast cancer incidence and some recommended monitoring and, 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 and uh, normalizing. And the data were mixed. And then this was another randomized trial in the Women's Health Initiative where we r randomized 36,282 otherwise healthy postmenopausal women to calcium, vitamin D at the dose and schedule currently at that time uh, recommended by the Institute of Medicine, which was 400 international units of D3 and 1,000 milligrams of, um, of calcium. Here's our breast cancer outcome, which I presented at ASCO, which is like uh, about as dead negative of, of a study as you could get. And um, so then I, I have become a little bit on the vitamin D side, a contrarian. We'll show you there's a little bit of a glimmer of information. Here's one of the problems that, that comes up with these 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels that are not, that's not commonly recognized. So this is, this is 2048, uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels measured in that study. So we had a subset of those patients at 25 hydroxy vitamin D. On the left-hand panel, uh, those, uh, those women had a av mean value of 23.6. Um, on the right-hand panel, those had 81.9, 25 hydroxy vitamin Ds. The dots are their dietary supplement uh, intakes. So we're looking at dietary supplement intakes versus drug levels, and you can see there's tremendous overlap. The, you know, there's a, tr a tremendous overlap between the lowest and the highest. Call your attention to the fact that the highest, which everybody would say now by any criterion, would have um, wonderful and, and above uh, normal optimal 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, only 3% of the women within the highest quintile of vitamin D were taking uh, more than 1,000 international units a day. 
So when we explored looking at all variables to look at the difference between 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels in two individuals, we can explain only 20 percent of the difference. This suggests that about 80 percent of the vitamin D levels in individuals is genetically determined. So it makes it difficult to, to attempt to uh, correct and treat those levels. So, so that's, um, and it remains an uh, amazingly complicated area. The Institute of Medicine updated their findings uh, just this last December. Uh, surprising to some people, they didn't recommend much, much higher levels. They are recommending now over 700 for women that are above the age of 70. And with their um, dietary intakes, uh, our women had that. Now here's the interesting signal for the medical oncologists out there is that Pam Goodwin sparked interest, which is the top panel there, in a uh, cohort where she reported 512 patients, women who, who, women who had the highest 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels had a lower, significantly lower recurrence risk. There were two negative studies that came out after that. Uh, now what we end up having, as you can see with the scoreboard here, we have four positive association studies and two negative association studies. So Pam Goodwin has a meta-analysis that's pending somewhere in the literature. Um, uh, there was a feasibility study done to see whether you could get, do a, 20, uh, a vitamin D adjuvant study since it has very little toxicity. What happened was that uh, looking at Toronto and Los Angeles, it turned out that 84% of the adjuvant breast cancer patients were already taking uh, vitamin D, you know, after diagnosis, and their average dose was a little bit of over a thousand. So it was felt not to be a feasible study. So actually, uh, as a you know, so we're, so we're giving we'll give our patients. It seems like a good thing for many of our uh, our postmenopausal patients to give them calcium and vitamin D. We're we're giving them all a thousand international units a day, which is a pretty safe dose um, with that uh, 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 with the um, with the same dose of of calcium. So uh, that could require further studies, but it's going to be difficult to do in, in an adjuvant um, study in the United States, at least. Okay, now we get to, to an area where really the data becomes real, much more compelling now based on observational findings, at least in my view, the, the um, uh, physical activities, the lifestyle factor most strongly and consistently associated with both breast cancer incidence and breast cancer recurrence. And this is really very startlingly positive data. Here's a recent meta-analysis of physical activity and breast cancer incidence in postmenopausal women. And you're seeing 25 percent um, or, um, or uh, 20 or 25 percent uh, lower breast cancer incidence in women who, have, uh, who are more physically active, There's also association with weight loss. The physical activity is a little bit, is really interesting, is that most of these studies, different than the heart disease, where you have to have sustained uh, heart rate increase, sweating, uh, here we're talking about um, modest walking. So speed, so walking uh, the equivalent of three to four hours a week will, will, will be seen in some of these associations. Here's one of the first studies in that area, physical activity and survival after breast cancer in the nurse's health study, again from Harvard. Um, and let's see, do we circle it? Yes, there, there's the, the women in the middle who are walking three hours a week we're having 40% fewer breast cancer recurrences. Breast cancer recurrence is a fatal disease. Walking three to four hours a week, right? You know, even in Minnesota, you can go to the Mall of America, like that, right? You know, and just getting from your car to the, you know, the stores in the middle will give you, you know, half your, you know, kind of daily allowance. One of the questions that came up, though, this was measured after a diagnosis. The question was, um, did that reflect what people had done before, you know, a lifetime of good walkers as opposed to walking after you get the diagnosis, like that. So, and so once again, the Women's Health Initiative um, has an answer, I think. Uh, this is with um, Melinda Irwin from Yale. This is an observational study, but we had serial physical exam uh, determinations. And so here we looked at patients on the left-hand panel who had no change and remained inactive. So inactive, inactive. In the middle are the increased to active. So they were inactive before and increased to activity. And the right-hand panel is decreasing 
Um, so they were active before, but decreased after breast cancer diagnosis. And, and the clinicians out there will see all three of these patterns. I mean, some of the, you know, because there are a lot of the reasons uh, people get knocked for a loop by our cancer therapy and they become inactive. Other people want to take up the measure. But look at this. In the in women who became inactive, who became active afterwards, even if they were inactive before, there was 33% um, fewer breast cancer uh, recurrences. So this is really... Um, pretty much, to me, compelling observational studies, study the ground for randomized trials. We're going to talk about just a couple minutes, because I want to leave some time for questions, of biological mechanisms. And you can go for days showing out these slides. But I think the, the, the way, um, which seems to be a little bit goofy when you mention it, and Ernst Winder talked about it a lot, but, but I'll just mention it to, as a unifying concept, is metabolic overload. You know, and the idea is that for thousands of years, I see Lucy's going back to Ethiopia, right, you know, kind of, so your last chance to see uh, Lucy. And uh, so she was like uh, uh, 20,000 years ago, was it a million, I forget, she's a real old. And, uh, <laughs> Up until about the last 200 years, what happens is we were chased by animals and eating berries and twigs, right? That's, that's what was happening, right? You know, can, and only in the last 100 and some years could you go to a store and buy anything, right? You know, I mean, you know, so, so all our, and, and all these wonderful mechanisms to preserve the cells so the cells don't die and everything are, 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 have been developed to preserve the cells, but for our major uh, preserving us, what are the drivers of us? Are, are things like insulin, uh, kind of, you know, kind of, uh, so insulin, estrogen, testosterone, uh, controlling markers of inflammation. So all the controls for those developed at a time when we were eating very little stuff and running around, not being chased, okay? And then the last few years, we've stopped running around and we're eating different stuff, right? And so what'll happen is insulin, estrogen, all those things go up. Here's just three quick feasibility studies, you know, uh, uh, little studies looking at um, Diane, Diana 2, these are in European studies, um, Mediterranean uh, diet and breast cancer patients. And it, it, what happened is in the study with about 50 patients in it, uh, body weight decreased, serum testosterone decreased, and bioavailable estrogen IGF-1 decreased. Um, here's studies that I was involved with in the Women's Health Initiative, relation of body mass index and physical activity to sex hormones. And the women, as you can see, who had high, the lowest panel, high body mass index, low physical activity, had, um, you know, kind of 40% higher estrone levels than women um, who were, had low body mass and high physical activity. We looked at that for insulin. I like this, the shape of this graph because we have in the bottom panel, we have physical activity, that little dot, the lowest dot are the people who were, had uh, the quintile with the highest activity with the lowest caloric intake. And the high panel in, in the left-hand corner were women who had the highest caloric intake in the quintile, the fifth of women who had the highest caloric intake and the lowest physical activity. And so you can see any change made a difference in slope for insulin, which would be one of these drivers of breast cancer incidence, breast cancer outcome. Okay, so, uh, and, and now, uh, in this era of targeted therapies and $10,000 therapy just approved for breast cancer uh, last week, I've, I could propose an adjuvant trial with modest cost. Say when a breast cancer, this is, this is data showing dog owners are much more likely than non-dog owners to meet physical activity endpoints, which would be consistent with the data I've shown you related to breast cancer risk. So every newly diagnosed breast cancer patient should be given a Labrador Retriever puppy. The acquisition cost of $500, maintenance cost of $1 a day for dog food. And, and one would anticipate a, between a 30 and 40% reduction in recurrence risk at that basis. Um, Mitch, I gave this uh, similar talk at, uh, at St. Gallen, Switzerland, at the breast cancer meeting about three weeks ago in Switzerland. Mitch Dowsett was his next speaker. And he said, uh, you'd have to stratify your intervention, he says, because he walks the dog in his house. And of course, <laughs> of course, it would not, I would dare say it would not be effective if the man of the house was doing the dog walking. So, so that's a caution if you're designing such a trial, right? Okay. We do have some feasibility trials. Um, um, uh, WINS2, which is, um, um, this was a, a UK attempt 
to duplicate the WINS uh, uh, intervention exactly. We gave them the WINS intervention. They were doing it the same way, and they were going to target ER negative breast cancer patients to try to duplicate that 70% uh, reduction that we saw in that subgroup, unplanned subgroup. Uh, they demonstrated feasibility with 300 patients. Um, they didn't get funding to go forward for full scale study. This is a LISA study, which, um, which was uh, uh, centered out of the National Cancer Institute of Canada. Um, Jennifer Ligabel was the lead from, from Yale. Um, we were one of the clinical sites. Um, what they did is they did a centrally mediated intervention. This is very exciting. Centrally mediated intervention uh, uh, targeting increased physical activity, this three to four hours of walking a week, uh, low fat diet, weight loss, weight maintenance. And they were able to achieve it in 328 uh, patients. Uh, the funding didn't go forward for a full scale study at that time a couple years ago, but now it's on track to have a possible slot in the intergroup trial. And so it looks like they're gonna require an 800 patient feasibility study in the US. But this becomes very simple because you don't have to say as a physician, I don't know how to do it, what's the cost? You just, all you have to do is you, you just give the patient a card and say, you know, call this number and have your credit card ready, like that, you know? And then, because the intervention is centrally done by, by experts. Okay, now do we have any randomized trials that are pending? And we have actually two Hopefully, Ligabel will come forward in the future with that, uh, with that intergroup, now I guess alliance study, would be all in the U.S. cooperative groups. But here's the German Success C study. Here's one of those 37 taxane studies on the left, but they got the funding agency to agree to do a, um, a very similar phone-based intervention targeting increased physical activity and reduced body weight. And uh, that study is accrued, but it has only about 1,000 patients in it. So they'll need to see a big effect, but it's a randomized full-scale trial within the context of a defined chemotherapy adjuvant regimen. So that's very exciting. The other one is, uh, we showed you Diana, Diana 2, uh, 1 and 2, which were feasibility studies, and they've gotten funding, and uh, this is a, a fully accrued study as well, where they're taking <clears throat> pre- and post-menopausal women, and, and they're looking for women at high risk for recurrence and looking, as you can see, testosterone, insulin, metabolic syndrome, they're looking for metabolic target to get this uh, kind of metabolic overload reduced. And they also threw in ER negative cancers to re reproduce the, the, the potential wins result. This is um, 1,200 patients, uh, so we'll see what happens uh, with that. Here's, I think this is really, to me, this is almost the most compelling thing. This came out pretty recently. and. Um, Breast cancer mortality in Japan and Korea from 1975 to 2010 has doubled. Breast cancer mortality has doubled. Okay, yikes, right? You know, you would seem to think that they, would, they should be concerned about that versus what they're concerned about now. That would be my advice. But um, the other part of it is that, okay, okay, that's, you know, that's, the you know recovery from this kind of uh, World War II and you know kind of deprivation and it takes a couple decades. Um, how are we doing? Well, I, see the units are something per hundred thousand, but it's around five to ten when you look at the curve. Okay, in the U.S. from '75 to 2010, what have we done? Introduce screening mammography, adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant hormone therapy, at her two adjuvant t targeted therapy, right? And what have we got? We went from the same units from 32 to 25, a 28% reduction. So this huge, huge difference in the middle is probably, un I mean, they're going there, and it's unrelated to what we're directing our therapy at. We're trying to measure 10,000 genes in the tumors, and we've got this you know, huge, huge difference that's not being addressed. I was going to put it up, but then it got to be too big like that. OK. And so what do we got for conclusions? I got. Um, you can see that oh, if you're doing modifications around a Western diet, not trying to make a bigger change, uh, then it looks like weight maintenance and physical activity where you have the greatest data uh, for breast cancer. Mediterranean diet, really intriguing with that 7,000 randomized trial for other diseases or all-cause mortality. Um, but uh, lifestyle factors have really demonstrated now uh, easy things to do that uh, can be associated with breast cancer incidence and, and recurrence. 
I guess the physical activity is easier than the weight loss because the weight loss has proven a difficult thing to do. Um, lifestyle change can be achieved at relatively low cost with centrally mediated interventions and with minimal side effects. I mean, that's back again to the minimal side effects business. Uh, side effects have been in these feasibility studies where now there's been over a thousand patients in these feasibility studies. You don't get much uh, side effects from in, you know, encouraging modest um, uh, physical activity and, um, and weight maintenance. And re re increasing research attention to this area is warranted. Maybe we have time for a couple questions. I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention.